Welcome, everybody. My name is Christopher Poulos. I'm a professor of communication studies at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And I'm here to chat with uh, Dr. Fiona Stanley, Associate Professor of Business Communication at Edinburgh and Napier University. We're here to talk about her book, An Auto, An Auto Ethnography of Fitting In on Spinsterhood, Fatness, and Backpacker Tourism. This book is a feminist narrative about the social roles of obedience and acquiescence to the norm, embodiment, heteronormativity, partnering, and about fitting in or not with those narratives. Set in the co context of transnational work in Qatar, China, and elsewhere, and road status is negotiated and performed among long-term backpacker tourists, the book serves as an exemplar of how autoethnography can illuminate socio-cultural normativities and their effects, which are rarely explicit, but which nevertheless have great potential to harm while also problematizing and rethinking the meanings and semantic boundaries of fatness, queerness, and heteronormativity. I wanna start off by just saying this is a wonderful book. <laughs> I urge everyone here to read it. Fiona, what you do is so well. You're such a great storyteller. Um, you draw us in, you suck us into the story, you paint the scene beautifully in every chapter. You, you, and so many of the things, even when you're doing things that I've never been near. I've backpacked a lot in the U.S. wilderness. I've never backpacked tourists. I've never done backpacker touristing. But a lot of your experiences are very different from mine. Still, I'm right there on the trail or in the city with you. Uh, and you have us, I mean, you have us bumping into dragons on page two. My God, I mean, I'm right there. You had me by then. Um, so thank you. It really is an excellent read and it has a lot to say about to all of us about fitting in about fatness and self image about feminism about anxiety and ambivalence about coupling and uncoupling or not coupling and spinsterhood about love and loss about privilege and normativity and not fitting in and so on and it's a great story and the best I have to say this right up the front so I don't forget one of the best things is we go through we every chapter we're in the story and then at the end we get hit with the critical turn at the usually at the end of the chapter though it's sprinkled in along the way but it's done so seamlessly that you don't realize that you've been brought into this uh this place and it's just wonderful um so well done and here we go thanks um, chris such a beautiful yeah. Yeah, it's good to hear you and good to see you um so before we, you know, I have a few questions to throw out there and we'll just, we're, we decided to do this as more of a chat than an interview, but I do have to ask, you know, I've done a lot of things at conferences. I've never done this, uh, this sort of interviewing an author in a, on a live Zoom format. I just want to make sure you get a chance to say what you want to say about your book. Um, yeah, so what do you want to say at the, at the outset? Well, I mean, from we we had a bit of an email back and forth, Chris and I, yesterday, and I'm going to read you about dragons, uh, just a few pages to start us off. Um, I know that at least some people here have read the book or seen the book. Um, Google Books has put up, I think, the first two chapters as a freebie, so you can have a little look if you if you want to, even now. Um, I'm going to start off, I think, by reading a little bit from the prologue. And then we can get into talking about uh, maybe some of the more thematic aspects of the book and maybe more of the process. But really, you know, I, I've lived and breathed this book for the last four years, so I have no real burning desire to talk about anything in particular. I'm much more interested in hearing what you all have to ask or say about it. So let me kick us off with some dragons. So this is from the prologue. It's page one. It's called Dragons. Um, from Sabang Beach on Palawan Island, there was a trail, someone told me, the monkey trail. The year was 2004, long before the internet was in every pocket and information was scant. But there was a trail running steeply up from the beach into the forest. This much I knew. The area was a national park and a UNESCO World Heritage Site, one of only a handful in the Philippines. And this information was a kind of catnip then, luring long-term shoestring tourists like me. As backpackers or travelers, as we called ourselves, we followed our lonely planet guidebooks and considered ourselves explorers. Aping the 1970s Euro-American drifters, although by then already part swallowed by mass tourism, we formed and reformed ever-changing unterritorialized backpacker assemblages 
within which we narrated our identities, establishing road status. In this we basked, fitting in amongst our odd kin, even as we barely touched local people's lives and sneered from a distance at our own frightened perceptions of those who worked bullshit jobs in our home countries. We saw ourselves as different and better, advancing a narrative of freedom. That was me then on Palawan in March 2004, 30 years old, standing on a beach considering a trail. It seemed adventurous and I needed to feel adventurous. I wore sandals and a dark blue cotton dress. I carried water in my red shoulder bag, scruffy from months of rough travel. I set out early from my rented A-frame beach hut and I went alone. Tree roots crisscrossed the dirt trail and branches reached out like offering hands. And I clambered, searching for snakes in the leafy hollows as I stepped over and around rocks and fallen trees. Soon though, I found a swinging walking rhythm and my feet found a pattern. Cicadas screeched their white noise and bright birds hid behind dense leaves until I came too close. Then they exploded, panicking and flapping in a shock of red feathers. On the ground, more birds strutted and pecked. A squat peacock patterned turkey walked ahead of me along the trail as if I were its chick. It didn't look back as I followed and it didn't seem especially rushed or panicked. We were just two forest creatures out strolling together. I walked behind my mother pea turkey, mimicking her jerky gait for a moment and laughing to myself. But then, as I turned a corner, I caught sight of something much bigger than either the bird or myself. On TV, I'd seen Komodo dragons. I'd seen footage of crocodiles, and the reptile I met on the trail was easily two metres long, black and scaly, hulking in its solidity. I stopped dead. My breath came in ragged bursts as my pulse, a scattered drumbeat, quickened in my ears. I stood, rigid. I watched. I waited. The reptile moved strangely. Horses and dogs walk with their hooves and paws in sequence, left front, back right, right front, back left. But this dragon lifted its back leg together with its right foot, its back left leg together with its front light, right leg, holding both aloft for a preposterous moment, as if a squat coffee table in a dream had decided to get up and move. Then its opposite legs lifted as if the dirt were hot and the lizard a brutalist flamingo. In this way, it inched forward and around. Each foot had curled claws as thick as pencils and its blue-black forked tongue darted out again and again, tasting my scent. My mother bird had abandoned me, but as I glanced off to the side, another slight movement in the bushes caught my eye. There stood a second lizard, equally squat, equally clawed and equally scaly. Its blue tongue darted out and in as I looked around, panicked. Was I surrounded? Standing on feet all but bare in pathetic sandals, my legs naked under a scrap of cotton, I consciously slowed my thinking. It went like this. Creatures with forked tongues are probably not crocodiles. This was correct. Creatures in jungles like this are probably not crocodiles. Wrong, they could be. Komodo dragons look like this. Correct. I was on a remote island on a remote jungle trail. Correct. The question was, was these, were these Komodo dragons? And if not, what were they? What I knew about Komodo dragons was this. They're terribly aggressive, they bite, it's venomous, and then the venom slows you, killing you, taking agonizing days, and then they eat you. Their teeth are serrated like a shark's and their mouths are full of bacteria. But what I didn't know was this. Did Komodo dragons live here on Palawan? Calming my breathing, I realized I didn't think so, what with Komodo being in Indonesia and all and Palawan being in the Philippines. But immediately my mind raced ahead. Nature doesn't care about international boundaries. Animals don't respect neat lines on maps. I'd recently read about a Siberian tiger attacking, attacking taxi drivers near Vladivostok airport. If Vladivostok wasn't exactly Siberia, this not being Komodo meant nothing. This could be a Komodo dragon. Panic logic raced through my mind until I shook my head once, forcing myself back to the present. The giant lizards were still there, but they didn't seem to be about to attack, as I knew Komodo dragons did, lunging at humans. There was no lunging going on. 
these dinosaurs were just browsing. This was the word that popped into my head. As if in library stacks, their heads swaying on thick scaly necks as they scanned the forest floor, tasting scents and shuffling their heavy feet. They rooted around almost as if they didn't care that I was there. Experimentally, I took a few slow, careful steps ahead. They didn't even look up. I edged around the closer one. Nothing happened. I stopped again. The lizards didn't seem interested in me. I didn't decide what to do next. My body did it for me. I ran. I ran along the trail and then at a safe distance, I slowed and looked back. The dragons were still in the clearing and I was a long way past them. My body fizzed with shaken cola adrenaline and I kept walking, slower now, glancing back and carefully scanning the ground in front of me, fainting at every breath of wind that ruffled the trees. Twice more, I met new enormous lizards and when I did, I soothed myself with logic. If they're this common, they're probably harmless, aren't they? Even in the moment, I knew this made no sense. Were they harmless? I had no idea. Later online, I learned they were Palaman water monitors related to Komodo dragons, but distinct. They'll give you a nasty bite. I'd been right to be careful, but they won't kill you. They'll ma they mainly eat frogs and rats. That's what they'd been looking for on the forest floor, I guessed, once I was showered and drinking coffee and reading about water dragons in an internet cafe in Puerto Princesa. But I wasn't there yet. I was still on the monkey trail, calmer now, but still so alert, walking up and over the hill and through the forest. Eventually, the trail popped back out onto the beach near a huge rock, building-sized, its overhangs offering shade. I felt accomplished, my body thrilling with the feeling of having done my first ever solo hike. I'd gone alone because it was that or not go at all, and I wanted to go, but I'd scared myself silly with the dragons. Now, relieved, I breathed deep, deeply, propped my camera up on a shoulder-height rock, set the timer, and took a selfie. It's 2004. Without planning to, I raised my arms, winner-like, triumphant. And looking at that photo now, me in my little cotton dress in the shade of a big rock on Palawan, the dense green dragon-filled forest massing behind me. I love that picture, which hides as much as it shows, a world of pride and shame. In it, I'm thin, although my calves are still thickly muscular. Just a few years before that, I'd been fat, and with that had become the certainty that no man could ever love me and that I would therefore never be normal or fit in. Uncritically, wholeheartedly, I bought into this mainstream social script in which girls' and women's worth is measured by the approval of straight boys and men, which starts and ends with women's conforming to societal expectations, including being thin, quiet and undemanding. I had absorbed this narrative from popular culture all around me. But less than four years before I walked the monkey trail, I changed all that. I got slender, fit, muscular, triumphant. In that picture, I fit in. I'm thin, society approves of me. Here I am, worldly and adventurous, solo hiking a jungle trail. But still, I didn't fit in, not really. Besides my triumphant stance in that picture, Hidden under the little cotton dress are folds of loose, soft, crepe-like skin that wrinkled across my belly. The white stretch marks are the tiger striped my upper arms and thighs. In that sense, I was still fundamentally worth less than the never fat woman, women who on the surface I now resembled. My new smaller clothes fitted me and hiking the jungle trail, I was fit, but still I didn't quite fit in. In part, this was because I was traveling and hiking alone and my sense of self oscillated between the badass solo traveler that I feigned and performed in the backpacker cafes, my road status and road stories, painting me as this lone adventurer conquering literal and figurative dragons and the tragic spinster, already 30, going alone because nobody wants her. So that's Thank from the you. prologue. Um, and I can't show you the picture. Well, I can show you. I can hold it up and show you it just now. There's the picture from the book. Uh, standing there triumphantly. <laughs> Chris has got the picture there too. So there are pictures in the book, but not many. Um, and that's part of the storytelling from the book. So yeah, that's the introduction.
Thank you. So if you haven't read it already, now you want to, I know this. And this is one of the favorite, my favorite things at conferences like this is hearing authors, my, fa my favorite authors, among which you now stand, Fiona, um, <laughs> give voice to their words. Because, uh, you know, you can read it, you read it yourself and you think, okay, what does this sound like? What does this really sound like? And you gave it the perfect performance there. I appreciate that. Um, and I, you know, as you, as you're, as that part starts to to allude to uh, beyond the story of the traveler doing adventurous things, uh, the thing I can't stop thinking about this major theme in the book, this notion of fitting in, it it's haunted me through my whole life, um, and that demon that you name, other people's approval that infuses pretty much all of your stories um, throughout the book. Is something I really wanted to talk about. You know, I personally, I think I've spent most of my life uh, tacking back and forth between trying to belong, fitting in, and feeling alienation or not fitting in. And your book, your book just evokes that beautifully. So I'd love to talk about fitting in and not fitting in and all of that for a few yeah. moments. Or I mean, I think for me, it, it there's there's the other people's approval, which I've made almost into a character of the book where other people's approval stalks like the dragon's stalk. And, you know, it's, it's as frightening as the dragons uh, and as omnipresent as the dragons, but it goes beyond just other people sitting in judgment as the kind of panopticon. There's also the introject, which is when other people's approval influence what I think of myself, where I'm looking to you know, a panel of external experts before I make the most basic decisions of my life, because on some level, I'm trying to uh, stay within what other people would think was normal or approved of. So it's, it's other people's approval sitting in judgment, literally, but there's also the other people's approval that snuck into my own head as societal norms and, and expectations. Um, how do we free ourselves even of that? I'm not sure. Um, I think hiking alone is one of the ways of doing it, because you, there isn't anybody else out there to judge but I'm not sure that is the answer because there's only certain parts of our life that we can do that whether you know literally or figuratively I think as humans we are very social and part of that being social as a, as a species is always looking to what is expected and normative and normal uh, around us and I guess if I've got a new year resolution this year it's to be more like a cat and they really just don't give a fuck what anyone else thinks and I think there's some real strength in that you know taking inspiration from other species that really don't have the same hierarchies and normativities that we do but you know I'm not entirely sure that we can uh, overcome our biology perhaps we can a little bit Ah, Stacy's cat. Is and there. I, you know, yeah, there you go. I, you know, you invoke cats. I invoke also dogs because um, on the other side of that, dogs have no judgment, right? right? They just they just love you. Cats don't give a fuck. So that's mm. that internal stuff. And dogs are the other side. Andy's got his dog up. Um, the, they're the other side of not sitting in judgment on us. And so um, you know, this thing of this what you describe so beautifully and what you weave into all the stories is all the ruminating and all the thinking and the pre-planning and the performing and the impression management that we do to try to hold at bay the judgment of other people and yet you know the anxiety that invokes and the ambivalence that invokes because you know most of us don't really want to do that or want or even want to admit that we do that it's it's anxiety of producing to think that i'm the kind of person even think that, that i'm the kind of person that cares that much <laughs> about other people's approval on um, or my own approval on the other hand um i spend so much of my time i've spent so much of my life in that world and um your stories beautifully describe that i think uh, the one of the main focal points of that is your relationship with Cain and how that really brought up for you all the issues about, you know, why am I in a couple? What, you know, what am I doing here? What am I doing in this, this performative dance of right. coupledom? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a sort of shame multiplied by shame there isn't there the there's the there's the shame at the beginning of that and then there's the shame of hiding the fact of having to hide the shame um so a big part of the story is as as chris rightly says uh, about the relationship with kane not his real name 
who is a, a very dashing Englishman who now that I've, you know, conquered the thing of having lost weight. Now you'll notice that that weight loss has, has uh, reversed itself as weight loss often does. Um, so there's that in the book too. There's that thing of trying to be normative in, in embodied terms, but you know, I, I did successfully lose weight and I did keep it off for 10 years, which is, you know, as far as the weight loss uh, literature goes, fairly unusual as a thing to do. And having done that, the next logical step in approval and other people's approval was, was becoming partnered. And I think what I didn't really admit to myself at the time was it almost didn't matter who that was. Um, so right from the get-go, I think I was probably using Kane as much as he was arguably using me. So there's, I think a culpability in there too I don't you know I don't think I come off from the story uh particularly well <laughs> in some ways um and I think that's what makes this kind of writing maybe hard to write possibly hard to read as well where you know there's there's a sense of knowing now reading back over it and writing back over it that that was not a stellar moment but you know that's that that was the reality of the thing was you know I knew that part of being approved of by other women in particular probably was having a partner uh, you know uh, and so I did uh, Kate and I got together we got engaged to be married and all the way along I knew on some level that this was absolutely nonsense this was not what I wanted at all but that doubt couldn't get into my head at all because I'd thrown my lot in with with the fact of being partnered uh, and that seemed more important than than the guy himself and he was I say in the book, knitted out of red flags, but you know, so was I. <laughs> I was in it for all the wrong reasons too. I was a disaster. So I think, you know, lots of people's early relationships probably can look back and see these sorts of things in them. Um, so in a way, there's a bit of an unreliable narration going on here where, you know, the narrator now, me now pushing 50 is looking back on that time. And I wanna reach through time and shake myself but that was how the thing was lived at the time. And, you know, at the time I was so concerned about fitting in and being normal that being partnered with a guy who was terribly bad for me didn't seem to be much of a burden to bear compared to the burden of not fitting in. Yes, yes. And, and I, do think, I do think though, sort of experience across time, you know, as we hit 50 and above, um, teaches us that we were much you know that that we were that we should go we, we should be able to go back and shake ourselves for all the things we did in my case it was stupid risky things you know but um dangerous things um that i'm fortunate to have survived but it, it's you know it's um still is it's quite haunting and and um and it's beautifully crafted you you're kind of holding your you're holding that relationship, you're trying to make it work against all the odds that you're putting, you know, that, that are there, uh, the red flags that you both carry, um, that this is not going to work, you're trying and trying, and it's getting, it is hard to read, because it's getting more and more miserable as time goes on, right, and, and you have this, um, you know, it's, it's like a project, but you're, you're like a, you know, the, you got your finger in the dike, and there's all these holes springing up around, and the flood is about to come and the dragons are about <laughs> to, to come down on this relationship and um and everything it means and everything it stands for um so that's just all beautifully done and that kind of gets me to something i really you know your your story is is uh, you know from this perspective um you know I, I, in the last session we we're talking at the end about um you know, hiking and hiking alone and all that stuff and the sort of significance that has for women, particularly not feeling safe, that question came up. For me, I never gave that a second thought. I've hiked in the wilderness by myself. Uh, and the only real time I've ever been afraid was an encounter with a grizzly bear, um, which, you know, was probably- That would do it. I've seen yeah, the that, that would do they're it. Big, they're big and they can eat you and they're fast. Um, and there was nothing I could do but wait and see what he did. Um, but, you know, I've, but I see, I, I, I'm, I am quite sensitive to that um, feeling, but your life, it's filled with adventure and, and a kind of boldness. And you do things, you do things in these stories that I probably would never have done. And I took a lot of risks, especially early in life, but 
Um, so there's this boldness there, but your anxiety and your ambivalence and all that also infuses the pages, not so much about the adventuring, but about the relationships that might or might not occur and your relation and particularly your relationship with yourself, which is a powerful, you know, this is, you're the character in the book, but you're that relationship with yourself is almost another character, if that makes any yeah. sense. I mean, I think there's a little bit of a cultural difference here if most of the people who are listening are North American, which is uh, in where I'm from, Scotland, uh, the UK more generally, and Australia, where I lived for a long time. It's fairly common for young people, either straight out of high school or after college university to take off on a trip of six months a year usually working in some crappy job for a few months six months whatever beforehand and then taking off um sometimes called the gap year or year out um in new zealand called the big oe overseas experience um i think that's less common in north american cultures um so i think when i did that I wasn't as adventurous as it maybe sounds from a North American perspective because it was a fairly common thing to do to go off and have a, a kind of gap year or, or extended you know suffer fest somewhere um, as, as a, a kind of trip so I think in a way that was part of fitting in as well was a sense that I was uh, first in family to have gone to university um, my parents had never been anywhere, they'd never traveled, and I was suddenly surrounded by people at university who had traveled, and I felt like I was, you know, really inexperienced, really, um, I'd never done anything. So, in part, at the beginning, I had to travel in order to fit in with that world. And it sounds maybe more adventurous than it really is, because I was doing it with more trepidation, and, and you know, it, it was like a kind of finishing school that I felt I had to do somewhere along the way it became what I did and then it probably became a bit of a comfort zone that you know moving to Qatar which I, I talk about in the book and then moving to China by then I was really good at moving countries and so I you know that that was easier for me than it would have been to try and find peace and, and contentment in you know suburban Edinburgh which is what I'm trying to do now um, and that that's actually not a comfort zone anymore you know I'm finding it really hard to stay put uh, COVID is certainly helping in that. Um, so I think in a way what comes across as adventurous, it, I mean it's in there for sure, but it was also a running away from seeming to be normative and seeming to be you know boring and uh, Billy Connolly the Scottish comedian talks about being windswept and interesting and I think I desperately spent my 20s trying to be windswept and interesting uh, even though I don't think it was particularly what I wanted to do a lot of it. So yes, it was adventurous, definitely on paper, but I think there was a battle even there. So yeah, it's just really funny you mentioned that because both my sons did an unusual thing for North Americans. They took a gap year after high school, but what was different about it was it was heavily supervised. It was right. outward. It was outward bound in Patagonia or another another outfit in Panama, Costa Rica, and Peru. It was world traveling, uh, heavily supervised and structured and safe uh, mm -hmm. to this the North American parents' mm -hmm. mind. Um, the, so there's not this culture of of just sort of going off like that. Um, but we did it. They did it. Um, so I, uh, yeah, that is cool. Um, that clarifies something for me that um, I hadn't caught really, which is, you know, that's normative <laughs> behavior. Um, and so that makes me wonder and want to talk about in your book, you talk a lot about normativity and, and sort of querying that idea and shifting what that means and, and um, changing our relationships to it. Um, and I just wondered, um, you know, that's, that's a big theme in the book too. Um, if you wanted to speak to that in some way. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel that, I don't know what it feels like to grow up as a boy and a man, but I can speak to growing up as a girl and a woman and, uh, that, you know, I think from early childhood, from things like fairy stories and Disney, there are certain normativities of how girls and women should be that were very 
pushed into and you know there's a certain amount of pushback of course now but there's still very strong gendered binary normativities which have certain rules about them and as an adult I think one of those rules is to be partnered and I think that's where the the binary thing kind of breaks down because even in even in queer circles it's still a normative to to be partnered Um, I think to be single is still quite queer in a way that to be queer is no longer so queer. Um, And I think when we think about what queerness means and being other and slant and uh, pushing against what is normative, the absolutely right and welcome marriage equality legislation that's gone through lots of countries, still not all in the world, is absolutely welcome and absolutely right. But does that does that make queerness more domesticated and more settled and more is it as queer anymore if it's just as coupled and suburban and normative and when I you know I'm pushing 50 I live alone I've never been married I don't have kids that I think is a very queer place to be um and maybe a sad tragic spinster place to be you know there's Had I lived in this very district, I live in Liberton in Edinburgh, which was one of the places where the witch trials in Scotland were were harshest. And, you know, who was the target of that? It was women who didn't have children, who lived alone, who caused trouble. Um, You know, there's a long history of women being persecuted and or ignored and sidelined for not corresponding to that wife and mother script. Uh, So I think when we think about normativities those normativities change and it's now much more possible and and normal to be half of a a queer couple but the idea of coupledom is still very central to what we think of as as adult normality and sort of social citizenship Um, and so to be single by choice not always my choice but by choice um, into adulthood uh, you know I, I think of it as being uh like straight washing or green washing there's a certain amount of couple washing and when i googled couple washing what comes up is pictures of couples in showers together um so there's not even the possibility <laughs> of using the term <laughs> couple washing <That's> <laughs> <laughs> so i have this friend here in greensboro who's a musician and she's in her 40s late 40s and she's um child free and, and partner free by choice um and um, she, you know, she also has, she's a kind of a radical songwriter, but she, she, and so she does her protests in music, but she also did it in her corporate day job. She um, heard that, you know, she talked, she got wind very quickly of what you're talking about, about the, the normative sort of advantages of coupledom and, um, you know, their, her company had, um, you know, leave for childbearing and, and family leave and all that sort of thing. And so she wrote a proposal and negotiated an equivalent for someone who's, as you call it, child free and in her case, what she calls partner free um, to have uh, an equal sort of footing. You know, we still, of course, legally around the world, single people aren't in those uh, positions. You know, as you point out, the tax laws and all kinds of rules around hospital visits and all that sort of thing do not advantage the single person. Um, again, so it's just sort of, it's almost baked into the the way our society, at least in the West, are structured. And maybe we need to keep, you know, we probably need to keep pushing against those normative sort of uh, roles and rules and standards and things. Um, so I always applaud people that are willing to speak that truth. Um, it's, yeah, it's a I big think, uphill battle, maybe, but. I think in popular culture, we see friendship as something that happens pre-couple like friends and post-couple like the golden girls and I don't think we see mutually interdependent friendship as being something that belongs in mainstream adult life Uh, we don't privilege friendship to our detriment I think there's a lot of lonely people because we're putting friendship up as you point out in your book, it's fairly easy to become lonely within the confines of a relationship, an ongoing relationship that where you're all of a sudden you're, you know, your friends are all couples and you're all, you know, and sort of, we have to kind of change the, the conception and the, and the, and the um, 
enactment of friendship um, in adult life. Um, mm -hmm. I noticed something very strange, which was, you know, my kid, when my kids, you know, I have kids by choice, they're now grown, they're 26 and 30 years old. But uh, when they were with us, there, a lot of our friends were their friends' parents. And as soon as they all went off to college, those people just disappeared. Like, yeah. They weren't really our friends. They were their friends and they were, we were associated by that. Um, so yeah, and it, we've had, you know, we've both, Susan and I who've been together for a long time have had to renegotiate what it means to be friends with people in, in adult life. And I think that's absolutely right on. Um, we need more of that. It's surprising how little has been written and said about friendship, I think. I think it there's really a is. theme of uh, maybe it's an autoethnographic piece waiting to happen. Maybe there's a theorizing needed there. But friendship is such a we, we don't really even have words in English for it that, you know, for example, in Polish, you can distinguish between a, a, a koleżanka, kolega and a przyjaciel, which is a really close friend that you, you just like a brother friend. And then a, a colega who's, I guess we might say acquaintance, but acquaintance sounds really negative. We might say playmate, something like that, that I think we don't really even have a language in English for talking about what friendship is and means and, and, and how it works. A friend of ours, uh, Alyssa Foster, um, it referred to me as one of her frolics. That's a friend nice. colleague several years ago at ICQI, and I was like, okay, we got to start using that word, the <laughs> frolly, because I have a lot yeah. of frolics around this community and around the ICQI and academic communities around the world and the critical auto ethnography conference and all that. Um, and so maybe there are women we do need more words for what, for who and what we are. I think we do. I really think we do. I have a, a conferencing friend, Tara McGuinness, that you maybe know from, from uh, Ireland, and she calls me her conference wife because we're always, you know, turning up at conferences and, and hanging out in a, in a, in a pair. Um, so I think we do need a language for this, and I don't think we've got a particularly developed set of vocabulary, but also the more effective terms as well. Um, yeah, so I guess the book in a way is you know where there is spinsterhood there that seems like a gap but what's in that gap is is other forms of of interconnections as as human beings um hmm. absolutely oh, there's a lot going on in the comments but i wanted to uh, and before we open it up i want, i did want to ask you a little bit of sort of a step back question you know um which is sort of i always like to ask this of other writers um you know, can you tell us a little bit about your writing process, your practices, what you do, how you pull this off? Because this is a substantial book with a big, with a lot of organization to it and a, and a lot of story to it. And um, it's beautifully um, structured and organized. But I, I want to hear more about how you go about the process of writing okay. such a book. So I started about four years ago. Uh, now it's almost five years ago, but I start, it, it took about four years from beginning to end. Um, I started by writing stories. I, um, I'll show you actually, let me show you the box. I've got a very heavy oh, basket. <laughs> I don't know how much of this you can see. This is the box of journals that I've been keeping since I was about 20. And I'll just do a little flick through one randomly so you can see what it looks like. Uh, can you see that? It's lots of uh, notes and writing and scribbles and stories. And, and so there's just tons of that stuff. Um, and I've been carting that bloody heavy box around with me for years. Um, so I, I had a chance. It was the beginning of 2017. I went part time at work and I read through it. I, I had time. To, to read through the box. And I thought, you know, I want to start writing some of these stories to, to remember. So I wrote a lot of the stories in my camper van. Um, you know, I would go away, hike during the day, come back to the van in the evening, and I would sit and write. And they started off as a series just of stories, travel stories, really. But what I realized as I was doing that was I, I was always coming up against the why, you know, why was I doing this? Why was I traveling? Why was I going all these places? And I realized that in order to talk about the what and the where, 
there was the why coming up all the time. And initially for me, the why was I had to go away in order to become the person I wanted to be. And then I could come back and be acceptable. That was that was the why to start with. Um, and so on to the stories, I kept, I, I then started adding the more, I guess, the deeper, the more, the more emotional parts of the journey. But then the more theoretical parts, the more critical parts that you, that you talk about, they were added much, much later. So the book was really a travelogue for quite a long time. Um, and then I realized it was doing a lot more than telling some, you know, 20 year old road stories which are interesting for me, but not particularly interesting for anyone else. And what it was doing, I think, and this is what I think autoethnography uniquely has the capacity to do, which is it was giving an insight into social, cultural normativities through the lens of lived experience. And so that was when I interleaved the, the more critical parts. So that, I think, was the story, which is a, a short, ish way of saying you know I opened my veins and bled onto the page you know that's what we all do in autoethnography but I don't think it was that I think at the beginning it was telling some entertaining stories that came from journals you know and also just at least justifying lugging that box around all right <laughs> you're carrying that thing around everywhere um we have about 10 minutes nine ten minutes left I'd like to open it up to the audience and have hear what your reactions are what you have to say what you'd like to comment or question uh, about and so on and we have uh, Karen you're muted well thank you so much so far this has been so interesting and really um, engaging you mentioned, uh, previously, you, you talked about shame multiplied by shame, and I wonder if you could explore that topic further. Mm, it's a good question. So I've um, I've cited a lot of Elspeth Proben in the book, and she's really the source on shame. Um, her work on shame is is just incredible. So I think Elspeth Proben is the is the reference there. When I think of shame multiplied by shame, what I mean is the shame of, for example, um, being a woman who gets facial hair, part of the shame is the facial hair and part of the shame is having to deal with the facial hair. There's the double shame of having a shameful thing and then having the shame of dealing with it, if that makes sense. Um, for me, shame squared is the shame of the shame and then the shame underneath it, um, which is something else with Proben has a whole book length study on. So it's not a very long answer, but that's where I would okay, Thank you. Yes, it's such a, an interesting and horrific feeling to have shame. I think shame is one of the ways that society uses to get people, especially women and girls, to do what it wants them to do. Um, no, I, I, I don't think it's unique at all to Western English language cultures. In fact, I think there are other cultures that use shame far more and shaming far more. Yeah. But I think it's a, a probably a universal human thing that we shame, feel ashamed and we are shamed. And that gets us to behave in ways that are seen as acceptable. Yes, and yes. that we can feel shame even though we have nothing to be ashamed of. So mm -hmm. one half of us can realise, I don't, this is not on me, but still. Yeah. The other person that writes about shame is Jonathan Wyatt. And he says, even at the point of typing the word shame, he feels shame. That, you know, there's, there's a, maybe a shame cubed, to <laughs> take the metaphor probably too far, where there's the shame of the shame, there's the shame itself, and then there's the shamefulness of writing about shame. Uh, and thinking about it, that there's there's layers of this stuff. Yes, it's kept me in years of therapy, honestly. Um, and you know, it's just no, it's no stranger to young men either. My our boys and young men either. My my Greek side of my family used it as a weapon, and they were very good at at piercing your soul with shame. Um, David Purnell, my friend, it's good to see you. I hope you're well. I'm doing okay. Thank you. And. Um, I, maybe I have a question in here somewhere, but I also wanted to just make a comment about the shame. Um, 
um, being able to review your book uh, was probably one of the greatest joys of, of last year by far. Um, it's such an excellent, excellent book. But I made so many connections, and I think that's another strength of autoethnography. If even if you're not experiencing the same thing, like I'm not a hiker, but there was just so many connections that I was able to make with the idea of shame and trying to fit in. And I think no matter what your background, that's something that we all struggle with. I mean, for me, it was um, trying to come out in a time when, uh, and there's still a lot of stigma around it, but being gay was so stigmatized when I was a young man. And uh, I made so many connections to that desire to want to be. And I want maybe the question is, uh, there's a cost to that, to that fitting in. And so what did you find that cost to be and how did that affect you in trying to fit in? I mean, I think you could liken it to the toxic closet. That for me being coupled when I didn't really want to be coupled, being, you know, conforming in all those ways that I did, you can do it, but it erodes your soul. Um, now I was lucky or and or agentic in that I decided at some level that it was better to not conform than to live in that way. I think a lot of people do live in that way. And, and you know, I'm really glad, stroke lucky to, to not have to. Um, I, I understand though, that for many people, there isn't the choices and the privilege that I had, you know, I have a, an academic language and a, an academic community that lets me explore questions like queerness and singleness and, you know, being the human old maid card without feeling that I'm being shamed for it. And maybe if I, you know, wasn't in that world, maybe if my world was, I don't know, bitchy little girls somewhere, like the world of, you know, high school, maybe I would have just stayed safely closeted in the, you know, awful relationship with the guy. Thank you. Darren. Hi, thank you. Uh, Fiona, um, gosh, I didn't really know your work until this conference, but I'm a huge fan now, so I'm looking forward yeah. to getting your book <laughs> and reading it. Um, I just want to say like a lot of your, the things that you've talked about today really resonate with me and my own experiences. Um, when you're talking about the idea of, um, of spinsterhood, I often refer to myself as a spinster. I'm 44 years old at this point. And um, I feel like I have, I don't fit in, I'm a, I'm a queer identified person. I don't fit in with, with straight culture and I don't fit in with gay culture either. And I used to be gay identified. And so I used to be into the gay scene and felt that I never really fit in there because of, of perhaps my queer identified body doesn't always work for, for gay men at times because I'm not, I am, um, I would consider myself fat. I have considered myself, um, you know, not going to the gym and maybe all those normative expectations that exist within the gay community as mm -hmm. well. And so what you're saying resonates with me. And there's also the I think for me, and from what you're saying, there's, there's an empowerment aspect to this as well, because you don't have to conform to either. And so there is this empowerment that you can get from just being yourself, but then there's also kind of, again, the shame of, of being alone. And so all of that resonates with me, but I want to um, actually ask you, there's a presentation later today by Chris Omni, where she talks about nature as a site of restoration. And for me, going out in nature, is a site of restoration where I don't have to be anything other than who I am. There's no expectations of me there. And I'm wondering, do you, do you speak about that in your book when you're on your hiking trails? Are those moments where you can be introspective and think about and, and, and come to, to terms with all of the things that you're talking about today? Well, okay, there's a lot there. First, I think we are probably soul siblings on some level. It sounds as if there's a lot of resonances there. So thank you for that. Um, Yes, I think for me, I don't want to call it nature because I think what we think of as nature or wilderness is, is very much messed about with by people. Um, so maybe non-urban spaces is, is closer to what I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely there's the, um, 
there's a freedom there that there isn't in a social place. Of course there is, because, you know, the trees don't care what you look like. Although the hiking shops do, because I find it really hard to buy hiking pants, for example. So the material affordances of how we get to be outdoors and in the forest. Um, Andy's laughing because I made him go to REI in the States and buy my pair of hiking pants. Because um, it's much easier in the States to get hiking pants. Don't you dare show those to the world, Andrew. <laughs> he's gone to get them I hate you so much don't you dare <laughs> um so there's the material affordances of of getting out into the forest which are just as judgy you know when I buy a pair of hiking pants they've got a number on them that tells me my value but then when I get out there I think I do get to leave some of that stuff behind but I, I think it's a choice to do so I think we can carry that with us you know you could be swimming naked in a Scottish loch you know, 200 kilometers away from the next nearest person. And we still carry our culture with us. And we can't not do that as human beings, that we carry with us everything that, you know, this is the interject. This is the thing of we still refer out for what is acceptable and we battle it. I think you're absolutely right that the homonormativity is just as harsh as heteronormativity. Um, and, and even to make that binary of hetero versus homo is, is a normativity on its, on its own, you know? So yeah, I think um, it, it's messy, this stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's messy and it's problematic, but, you know, maybe talking about it and thinking about it opens up places where we didn't realize that the, it was possible to let the light in. I don't know if that's much of an answer, but maybe it's more questions. Funny, funny story about those hiking pants. So my dad <laughs> <Yeah. we> <laughs> went to my dad's house because I was visiting my parents. And so my dad opens the package and he says to me, so, you know, Andy, I've gotten used to you painting your toenails, but now you're ordering women's hiking pants. <laughs> and, and I was like, no, 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 that's for my friend Fiona. Remember I told you, he said, oh, okay. I feel yeah. much better now. So you say, he said, <laughs> he knows you. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think the, the, it's something I posted a thing in the previous session. I did a paper called unlikely hikers that was talking about um, hiking while fat and also hikers of color, queerness and hiking. And part of that is about the, the affordances, both the, the physical affordances like, you know, hiking boots and things, and then the more intangible affordances like what society thinks about you or me hiking by ourselves. So the, I'll, I'll drag that back into the chat in this one if, if you guys are interested. I'm going to plug another of Fiona's papers because it's a different travel. This is actually the paper that I found her work based on. Um, and it's about her travels through her PhD program. And Darren, I know that we're in similar stages of our PhD. So like you might find that a rewarding piece to, and that's actually like where I found her work. And then I was like, wait, she writes about travel? That's everything I write about. Perfect. Wow. Well, this, this has been a great session. We've run past time a few minutes and I thank you everyone for your engagement. Uh, and I wanna thank Fiona for doing this. I really appreciate your work, your book and everything you've done here today. So thank you. Thank you for such a beautiful intro. Thanks, Chris. Do you have any last words, Fiona? I don't uh, over to anybody else if they want to say anything, but I'm I'm all good. Thanks just to Tony for, for the edit. He made the book loads better than it would have been. I just have one word for you all. Right. <laughs> well done, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>